excited. Today, I, last time he shared with us, I didn't give him even a heads up that we would be sharing together. So this time I gave him a few days notice to let him know we could be sharing about uh, this topic, about really knowing God's voice and how important that is. Yeah. So um, one of the first things I was even thinking about in this conversation is about hearing God's voice. Again, it's just to really recognize the value in hearing God's voice. How valuable is it that we hear God's voice in, in every day of our life? And, and there was a scripture I wanted to point to today, and it says this, it out of Matthew, and this was Jesus talking. It says, but he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. It says that his words are our life. And it compared it to living off bread. And, and you know a little about that. James has given up bread for the past three months. That's the hardest thing to give up. And he's barely surviving. He's been doing the keto diet. But here in the scriptures, that's what it's saying. It's saying that it's just as important as us eating every day is. So is it that we hear the word of God. Every single day, it could be attributed to just like it is to live. It's, it's something that we live by. And so there's such value in hearing God's voice, Right? So much value in, in hearing God's voice. And, and, I, and I was thinking about just the idea in our culture that sometimes we don't recognize that God even still speaks. We don't expect to hear God speak. And today we talked about normalizing uh, healing, but I wanna normalize hearing God's voice. Normalize hearing God's voice in our lives. You know, it's such an important thing to be able to hear God's voice. Yeah. yeah there's something I talked to the guys about is uh, the difference between uh, knowledge and wisdom mm -hmm. and knowledge is stuff that you learn here on earth you know about life but wisdom is something that is a mixture of knowledge and like it's spiritual knowledge is yeah. what wisdom is and um, I always point guys when they're new to the faith to Proverbs because Proverbs is a book on wisdom that's what it's about and if you don't know the backstory, David you guys all know David from David and Goliath who went on to be the king of Israel war he had a son, and his son's name was Solomon, and, and uh, God told him that he could have anything he wanted, and Solomon asked for wisdom. That's what he asked for, and he ended up being the wealthiest person that we know of ever to live, and uh, he wrote the whole book of Proverbs and just gave uh, wisdom and insight into to God, and so there's this verse that I tell the guys all the time. It says, it says go and get wisdom. But in all thy getting, get an understanding. It's saying like it's, it's important that you press into God's word and that you understand. He actually calls it an enigma and, and understand the riddle and the enigma of what's going on. And uh, because, you know, as you go and re start reading scripture, you'll notice that some of the spiritual wisdom is counterintuitive to some of the things you hear on earth, if that makes any sense. Sometimes God, uh, the earth tells you, you know, two plus two is four. And God will say, sometimes, sometimes it equals five, though. If you'll follow this pattern, uh, it works different in my kingdom. You know what I'm saying? The right. spiritual realm is different. So anyway, the difference in the two is knowledge is things that you guys learn. You can watch YouTube like me, just way too much YouTube. And uh, hours of documentaries, that's knowledge. But wisdom is like spiritual knowledge. Right. And that comes from reading God's word. For sure. And I think that's something that we need to, again, normalize, getting to have God's wisdom in every day in, in all things. Yeah. And, I, and I think sometimes we do ask for God's voice on some specific things, like which lotto numbers should I pick here at the gas station right now? We get real holy right there at the counter when we're picking our lotto numbers, right? Or should I take this job? Or should I marry this girl, right? We begin to ask God for specific wisdom. But today I want to talk too about not just the specific times we ask for direct in our life from God, but really that God calls us to ask God every day for just general direction in our lives. Just how do we live every single day? What's the wisdom in our life look like that we can glean from God and glean from the Holy Spirit in our every day? Again, not just getting uh, living by every day. We don't live by bread alone, but by God's word every single day. God, what is the direction that you want us as Christ followers? What's, how do we live? How do we pray? How do we love? How do we... Uh, how do we minister to the world around us? How do we really model the life of Christ? It's not just about lotto tickets, you know? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> and I think if you're in any position uh, like mine at all, sometimes you have to deal with conflict. And mm -hmm. conflict is hard because you don't want to do any damage. You care about people. So that's another thing that, at least for me, just give you some insight into my path. I have to pray about probably the most is I have to go deal with something difficult. I got to go fix a situation. 
what is the best way for me to do this, God? You know what I'm saying? Like, I need you to go in front of me and advocate on my behalf because this is a tough situation and we have to work this out. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so how can I do this and like still honor you in the process? Right. And I think finding God's voice in general direction does take time. You know, this, this whole entire book is the book of God's voice. And finding God's voice on how do we live and how do we look and how do we love, right? That's something that we really get from knowing God. It's important that we, we know God's word, we know his ways, and that we also know the Holy Spirit that's here to lead us and guide us every day. So, so there's a general direction, right, that we look for in our lives. Just how do we live as Christ followers? God, what's your purpose? What's your plan, right, for my life? But then there's that specific direction that we were talking about a few minutes ago, about asking God specific questions in our life that we need direction for. I think sometimes, though, where we're missing it is we don't take the time to get to know God's direction in a general direction and we really only listen when we want to hear him specifically. And, and I wrote this down. I said, our ability to hear God's voice in specific circumstances comes from our practice in seeking him in all circumstances. And I think sometimes we get to the counter to pick out the lotto tickets. Like, I just can't hear God's voice. Well, it's a lifestyle of living and learning to listen to that voice of the shepherd. And the more that we live a lifestyle of being plugged in and keen into his ways and his word and his Holy Spirit, we develop this ability to hear his voice louder than any other voice. And it becomes very clear and easy for us, even in those specific directions, God begins to speak to us on the job or the spouse or the house, right? We begin to hear God's voice more more clearly, but it comes from the practice of learning to hear God's voice every day. Yeah, I wrote, uh, we can't hear when it's something big because we're not listening when it's small. Like we haven't trained ourselves how to just live that out where mm -hmm. God's a part of every step you take. Yeah. And then we finally get to something huge and we're like, where are you at? You right. know, and we haven't learned how to, you know, the scriptures say that God speaks in a still small voice. And so sometimes the world's loud and busy. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times, the one that's actually the worst, your worst enemy is like your own thoughts. You know what I mean? Like you actually are the loudest. You're so loud actually that you can't hear anything God's saying because you're filling in the gaps with your own thoughts and doubts and what ifs and anxiety and worry. That, uh, that's, that's where uh, knowing the word comes in mm -hmm. because sometimes when you know it, you know what I'm saying? You, you can play that. God's reel of truth can kind of override some of your thoughts sometimes. You guys, uh, what's it called? Spiraling. I'm sure some of you know about that. You start going to this thought, and then it goes to this thought, and then this one. And before you know it, you're like, we're being taken over by aliens, and there's no point in living <laughs> at all. You know what I mean? And then before you know it, you're like in a bad place. So when you feel yourself start to spiral, that's where you can kind of go back to the word and go, wait a minute, let me hit the brakes. I'm being too loud. What does God actually say here? You know what yep. I mean? Yep, yep, for sure. And I think sometimes, like today, I really want to talk about knowing God's voice because like he said, there are a lot of voices out there. And how do we know the difference between God's voice and our voice and our mom's voice, right? How do we really know it's God's voice? And I think one thing that's really sad but true is often God's voice has been really misunderstood. I think his voice has been misunderstood and his voice has been misrepresented at times. And I think that's made people react in different ways. I think there's some people that um, are hesitant to even say they're hearing God's voice because they want to protect God's voice. And if they're wrong, they don't want to reference him right or mislead people in a wrong direction. But I, but I think that a lot of people have just kind of turned like a, like a blind eye to God's voice or just a coldness to God's voice because it has been abused so many times. And so I do think uh, hearing God's voice is it's powerful and amazing, but I think there's a, a responsibility that comes with really being able to know God's voice from the different voices in our lives, really. Sure. I think, uh, you know, if I could speak on this piece, the, uh, you know, people, they are hesitant to say God told me because they've seen, uh, they want to be very careful about saying that God commissioned you to do something because you've seen people go out on behalf of God and weaponize his word and use it against people. And, you know, people ask like, well, how do you know the difference? Like, you know, what's the difference? How do you know uh, that you're not doing a bad thing or you're doing a good thing? And the scriptures that I try to give the guys is, uh, there's a scripture that says, they will know me by your fruits. So it's saying like, 
they'll know whether or not God is a part of it because life will come from it. And if, if death is what's coming from it, and confusion and fear and anger, then it isn't God. It's actually probably just you alone. But if God's with you, then it's, he says that life will come from it and people will know me from that life. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And so it's really like whenever you, uh, you know, a second ago I was talking about conflict and having to deal with uh, tough situations. And it's something you can ask yourself before you approach somebody. Am I coming on with a spirit of restoration or am I coming with a spirit of retribution? Mm -hmm. Because they're very different things. And this goes for God's word too. It's no different. So if you're going to help someone because you really care about their soul, ask yourself this before you go confront them. Are you really trying to restore are you trying to seek retribution because they're not listening to you and you're upset that they won't accept your influence? And so you then turn the Bible into a weapon and use it against them because of your lack of influence. Does that make sense? So a lot of times those moves that you see Christians make are actually more rooted in control than love. And it's something that everybody can be guilty of if you're not careful, me included. So it's something I have to challenge myself on all the time. If I'm going to say, if you see someone in your life, let's say, and they're living recklessly and you can kind of see where this is headed. Hey man, if you stay on this path, it's going to end bad for you. There's nothing wrong with confronting that person. You just need to make sure that you do your job first. And that's making sure that your actual goal is restoration. Yep. God wants to restore them back to the best version of them. You know what I mean? And if we're not careful, sometimes we let our own control get in the way and our lack of influence, and that upsets us, and we want retribution. And that feels completely different. So that's where that fruit idea comes from. The yep. fruit of whatever you do is the byproduct. So if you go into the conflict and it comes out, I've had conversations when I let God lead me that uh, are very tough conversations, but they end in life and mm -hmm. people are happy when they walk out of the room. I've also done the opposite. I've had conversations where I left God out and it was just me and it was just retribution. And I got my way, but it ended in death and destruction. The person was frustrated, the relationship soiled. You know what I mean? Yep, yep, for and, sure. Uh, so anyway, it's important, I think, to, like you were saying, to listen to God so that you can know uh, he can really lead you on when it is time to act. Does it make sense? And I think people have seen Christians just firing on all cylinders sometimes, kind of firing shots at people. And you can always, like, I always say you can smell the difference. You can, like, tell the difference whenever they're doing it out of love or control. And when they're doing it out of control, it doesn't smell right. You're like, you know, I don't know what you have to offer, but I don't want it. It's the vibe that you get in return. And it's because it's not coming from the right spot in their heart. You know what I mean? Right. That's so good. Yeah, I, I, I was thinking in my notes, I put uh, handle with care. Because I think it's important that we do, yeah. we handle God's voice with care. Because uh, it is the most powerful voice that there is available to us in our lives. And it should be treated with care. It should be treated with honor. It should be taken seriously and, and treated with respect and reverence, you know? And I was actually laughing because I was thinking about how uh, we misuse God's voice sometimes um, it, for good reasons, right? Like, but it's sometimes it's just misused and sometimes it's misunderstood. And I was laughing and, and, and you youth kids are gonna understand this growing up in church and being at summer camp. There was this thing that happened every year pretty much at summer camp, you'd get over there and you'd find a new guy or girl that you liked and you'd start dating for a couple of weeks. And then after three weeks, you'd be really tired of them because you were with them every day. And you would do this thing. You'd go to them and you'd say, we need to break up because God told me I need to, I need to focus on him. It was just the classic, God told me we need to break up so we can focus on our relationship with him. And it's funny and it's such a good one. Like you really don't take any responsibility. It's all him, not you. But it's one of the times that I think that sometimes we misuse God's voice to justify our own thing or our own agenda. And as funny as that example is, I think that we do that sometimes on much more serious examples as well. Yeah, I, Pastor Wes actually preached a message on this a couple weeks ago, maybe two weeks ago. But he was talking about how make sure that you don't abuse the grace that God gives you in your life um, to excuse the lifestyle that you're living mm -hmm. instead of using that grace to propel yourself and go to the next level. 
You know, sometimes God extends grace to you so that you can make it to the next level. He wants you to be the best version of you. He's constantly trying to restore you to that. But instead, sometimes we take that grace and go, oh, cool, I didn't get caught. I guess I'll do it again. You know what I mean? Instead of going like, oh, wow, God spared me. I need to come up out of this. You know what I'm saying? And not that you are criminals, but I'm just right. using that reference. Right. <laughs> Uh, but you also had another example that I thought was really good, talking about not using his voice as an excuse not to move. Yeah, I mean, something for sure with guys is, is work. I mean, guys all have to work, and getting a job is tough, and it's really hard working a job that you don't have any passion for and, or a job that you feel like doesn't pay enough. And, uh, but I'm a firm advocate on if there's a job out there and you can take it, then you should, because anything's better than sitting on your mom's couch making... You know, and sometimes it's like, well, they're only paying, you know, well, let's throw out our number, $7 an hour. Like, okay, well, you're making zero an hour right now, right? <laughs> right? So why don't you go ahead and go to work, and then we'll just see what happens. And I really believe this. I think when you take a job, um, you, you begin to be busy, and there's something about when you start working, if you'll let God be a part of your work, and this is actually scriptural, in, in Colossians it says, commit to the Lord whatever you do. Uh, it doesn't say think, it says do, right? So this doesn't work if you're on the couch. You have to get up and go. So commit to the Lord everything you do, and he will establish your plans. And so I really think that when you go up and when you're busy and you put your hand to the plow, that God can start to open doors and reveal things to you about your career, and you never know. You never know where you end up. You know what I mean? So that's something I tell guys because, you know, of course, a lot of times they're like, there's nowhere to work in this whole city. And I'm like, well, did you try that place? He's like, yeah, they want me to work 40 hours a week. <laughs> You know, and it's like, I think you maybe should change your perspective a little bit. I think you might actually be the problem here. I'm just saying. But, uh, you know, they, or, or they, they use the, I've heard the God thing, you know, like, well, God really just hasn't opened up the dream job yet. Right. So obviously I should still just sit at the house. And I'm like, I don't think that that's how it works all the time, man. Now, I'm not saying that God can't open the dream job for you, but I am saying that there is something to putting your hand to the plow and being busy and when you do that, God can open doors. There's another verse that says, so for everybody out there that's working a job that they hate, because this happens to guys a lot, you feel like you're not getting paid enough, you feel like nobody sees you, and you're grinding. And there's somebody in this room, I guarantee you, that has a job like that right now. But scripturally it says, stand firm, your labor in the Lord is not in vain. And so it's something I tell the guys, it's like, who are you working for? Are you working for the boss that you hate? Or are you working for God? Because if you will go out and commit your work to God, he sees everything that you do. Don't worry so much about that boss. And in due time, have you seen a good man that, that does good work? This is the scripture. It says, have you seen a man that does, does good work? Yes. It says that God will go and put him before kings. So it means like when the time is right, God will put you in the right spot. You know what I mean? Yeah. Anyway, I went on too long. Yeah. It's all right, all right. No, I think that's a good point because I do sometimes think that we don't move. We go, God hasn't spoke to me yet, so I can't move from this spot. And I was actually a little convicted when you were sharing that with me last night because I thought about all the times that I tell my kids I can't do something because God hasn't spoken. I, I have this thing my kids are like, my mom, can we get a pony for the backyard? And instead of being like, no, that's crazy, I say, well, I'll prayerfully consider. That's like my great mom 101, I prayerfully consider. And I just prayerfully consider to the end of the time and Lord never speaks. And so I actually should probably quit doing that and quit blaming God that we can't get the pony and really just own it. We're not getting a pony, right? <laughs> Especially a unicorn, are you kidding me? So yeah, I think sometimes we use that as an excuse not to move in our lives when really we should be moving and God's with us and talk to God along the way, but get your feet and, and get moving. But I think sometimes another way that God's voice is misunderstood as we have interpreted a meaning of God's voice, maybe something out of the Bible or something we felt like God said to us for so long and never really questioned um, if we've heard that correctly. And I was thinking about song lyrics and how there's so many times that we hear a lyric a certain way and it's not until somebody else in our life like James goes, what are you singing? Right? Like, I don't know, maybe this is just me, but how many of you thought Brown Eyed Girl started, hey there, amigo, right? Is, is that just me? Okay, well, it doesn't start, hey there, amigo, or, or Bon Jovi living on a prayer, like, oh, right, you know what song? It, it doesn't make a difference if we're naked or not. 
right? No? Okay. H- how, about, um, how about I like big butts and a can of limes? <laughs> there y'all are. Y'all are with me. Everybody thought it was a can of limes, right? No, not at all. He said, don't use that reference. I'm like, it's so funny though. I have to. <laughs> but it's like this sometimes in our life, right? We have gotten so stuck on oh, something in our head that God said, or we have interpreted out of the word of God, and it's actually not right at all. And we've never stopped to really challenge what we're saying and what we're believing. And when people in our lives stop and say, hey, you should maybe challenge that thought, instead we get angry and we get closed off and we really aren't even open to saying, Holy Spirit, am I even interpreting this right, you know? Yeah. And so I think it can be really dangerous if we don't question if the voice that we're hearing really is the voice of truth. And and that's something that that kind of scares me right now in our world. It doesn't scare me, but makes me feel very aware and want to be intentional about God's voice. Because I think as a society, God's voice has been misunderstood or people even just don't want to hear God's voice. And what we've done is we've made God's voice and God's truth become something very subjective in our lives. And instead, we've elevated man's voice of reason and placed it above God's voice saying that God's voice isn't true or it's misunderstood. And really that is the voice of truth. You know, it's been such an empowering statement that we've been saying in our world in these days of of live your truth. But it's not about living your truth. It's about living God's truth, right? And it's his truth that sets you free to be able to live your truth. Right? And, and there's a passage that I want to read to you guys this morning. And this is what Jesus was telling everybody. He says, but when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears and he will tell you what is yet to come. There is only one voice of truth and that's God's voice. And that's really the Holy Spirit's job in our life is to speak on behalf of the voice of truth. And that's what Jesus was telling them. I'm going to send the voice of truth. And here, and here is the truth, guys. Without the spirit of truth, there is no truth. That is really the only truth, is, is the spirit of truth and the truth that God brings, right? Yeah. And so that, that is the spirit of truth. So, so that's kind of where I want to turn this conversation this morning is how do we really know that we are hearing the spirit of truth in our life? How do we know that what we're reading or what we're interpreting or what we're living out is truth from the spirit of of truth, and so I kind of have three points this morning I wanted to talk about. Uh, the first thing is that the, the voice of God will never contradict the word of God. If you're taking notes, write that down. The voice of God will never contradict the word of God. And that's something that I think that we sometimes take for granted is the power of the word of God. That this, that this word of God, our Bible, is something that was God-breathed. Let me, let me read you what it says in Timothy. It says that all scripture is God-breathed and useful. And I wanna read it to you out of the Passion Translation. It says it this way. God has transmitted his very substance into every scripture. His substance is into every scripture. For it is God-breathed. It will empower you by its instruction and correction, giving you the strength to take the right direction and lead you deeper into the path of godliness. It's the word of God that leads you into the path. In fact, it's God's word that says, my word is a lamp into my feet and a light into your path, right? That's what God words, a lamp into our feet. It lights our path. And so the word of God is something that's very powerful and very important when we are interpreting the voice of God, the voice of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, and just to speak to that light part, it, a minute ago I was talking about spiraling. When you get into a really dark place in your life, which at some point in your life you might get there, I hope you don't, but if you do, and you spiraled your way to the bottom, um, I really do think that this is what this verse means. It'll be a lamp to your feet so that you can get out. It'll like guide your path out of the darkness back into the light. And so sometimes... All your circumstances when you're in that darkness feel hopeless, like you don't have any hope at all. And I think God's word, when you start to read it, brings hope back into your scenario. And uh, it really does function like a lamp in the darkness so that you can see Mm -hmm. the right path and get back where God wants you to be, which is filled with hope. Yep. 
And I think sometimes it's intimidating to read God's word because sometimes, to be flat out, some stuff I still read. I'm in the book of Revelation right now and it's was way crazy, right? And I think sometimes we get intimidated because we feel like we're not understanding what we're reading, but that's really how powerful God's word is. Even if we're not understanding everything, it's getting on the inside of us and it's building our spirit man and strengthening us on the inside. And so don't let the word of God intimidate you. Really dig in and like he said earlier, start in the book of Proverbs if you want. It's a little bit more simpler. Or just go start reading the life life about Jesus. His life was an anointed life. And just by reading about his life, that brings power into your life and it brings understanding, even if you don't realize that you're getting an understanding of God's life. And so it's powerful. So the, so the voice of God will never be contradicted by the word of God. They will always be the same. But the second point I wanted to share with you guys this morning is that the voice of God will never contradict the life of God. And here's what it says in John 1. It, it says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. So we know that this word is the word of God. It is God. But then you go down a few verses and it says this in verse 14. It says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That word is Jesus. Jesus is the living example of the word of God. And that's why he sent Jesus, because there was this word of God, but sometimes the word of God was being misinterpreted. Sometimes there were things being scriptures taken out of context, and like you shared a minute ago, being used for retribution, used to punish, used to, to judge. And so what God did is he said, I want you to see my heart. So let me make the word become made flesh, and let me send Jesus, so you will have a man to represent everything I am. He will become the spoken word. He will be the life. And so God's voice will never contradict the spirit of life. It will never contradict Jesus. It never will. Jesus will always be consistent with the word of God and consistent to what the Holy Spirit is showing us. Yeah. Always. You have anything to add to that one? No, nothing. Nothing to add there. Nothing. You covered it really well. Covered it really well. Okay. So let's go to the third thing that we are going to use to know that it's God's voice. That is this, that the voice of God will never contradict the spirit of God. And here's Jesus again, and he's speaking, and this is what he says. He said, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. The words that God speaks to us will be spirit and life. And you talk quite a bit about just that life and that light that the spirit of God infuses us with when he speaks. Yeah, I mean, you can feel it. I, I was, I've told the story before, but I was editing a, I, I came on staff here back in 2005 to edit the TV show. They used to have a TV show back in the day. And uh, Pastor Al was on it, and I was watching one of his sermons, and he was talking about uh, the Spirit of God woke me up and told me these things. And then he said, you might ask, how do I know that that's God? And he says, because it brought me great life. And um, that was something that I kind of latched on to and then went and did a little scripture research, and it just... It talks about like the like she's saying the spirit of God when when it's something that He's put inside of your heart it brings you life and I know that you guys I, that sounds weird because we're all alive but being alive and being full of life are like two different things being alive is like I'm just breathing and I'm here but being full of life is totally different that's like the passion and the energy. Um, that I think sometimes gets sucked out of us. You know what I mean? Like, especially living in this world with some of the social media out there, like it vampires all of your life out of you. And so um, I think being full of life is something that when it really is God's spirit that puts it on the inside of your heart, you know, and you feel like oh, this is definitely God. You know, like I feel, I feel really moved to do that. But I don't know if you were gonna talk about this part yet, but you know, just about trusting not, not going too far into how you feel. Yeah. Because um, like she was saying a second ago, sometimes you get all jazzed up thinking you heard something from God, but it actually contradicts his word. And so you go start swinging swords is like the way I me metaphorically talk about it. But you start going out and making moves because you got really excited, which is great. You just have to make sure that it's balanced and that you're, that like God's word backs up these emotions that you're having. There's a, there's a verse in Proverbs that says, whoever, he who trusts his own heart is a fool, but whoever walks wisely will be delivered. And, uh, you know, we talk about heart all the time. I thought I was supposed to follow my heart. What's up with that? It just means, like, uh, follows your emotions too much without balancing that, you know, and you, uh, you may not have talked about this part, but God, 
God came in 100% grace and 100% truth. Um, it's a mixture of both, and it's a balance of both. You know, God, uh, Jesus came with ultimate grace for everybody, but he also came and brought really harsh truth to everybody. You know what I'm saying? And uh, Caiaphas was one of those people. He was the church leader at that time, and he really personified what I was talking about a minute ago with that. He did not like that Jesus had all the influence and that bothered him. And so he used the name of God to try to, he's actually the one that got Jesus crucified because he had his influence taken away and he wanted retribution against this so-called savior of the Jews and convinced the Romans to kill him. And it was all because of his heart posture not being in the right place. Anyway, the point is sometimes uh, it's important to follow the life, but if you are not careful, sometimes you can act before you should, just because you're excited about something. Yeah, for sure. There's really, and that's, that's about these three points that we've made. There's, again, there's the word of God, right? And then there's, there's Jesus. And then there's the Holy Spirit, the life inside of us that we are, that we're in tune with. But I think sometimes, I mean, I, being in church, I feel like I've watched the pendulum swing. I've watched uh, the church sometimes rely so much on the word of God that they were losing the life of God. Right, we were so we were so heavy on the word that we weren't making sure that it also wasn't contradicting the life of God and the life of Jesus. But then sometimes I see this pendulum swing so far over here that we're so invested in just feeling what makes us feel life that it's not consistent with what the word of God says. And and I was laughing because I was reading a book and it was talking about in a in a particular church there was a small group, a men's small group, and one of the guys got up and he proudly proclaimed that he was cheating on his wife and having an affair. And then he followed it by saying that it was actually biblical because the Bible said that it wants us to live a happy life and that God was full of love. And he was proud of himself because not he was living a happy life and he was full of love and clearly he was doing the right thing. And it made me laugh because I think it's one of those times that we have found something that you might feel like gives us life or we've taken God's word and we've kind of tweaked it and made it fit our own agenda, but we haven't really compared it with the word of God and what God really says. And so if you really wanna know that if the voice that you're following in your life is the voice of God, it will not contradict any of those three. It will always align with God's word. It'll always align with the life of Jesus and it'll always align with the life that's inside of you, that life-giving spirit that the Holy Spirit brings in our life. And sometimes that, that, that life sometimes isn't what we want to hear. But when it's the Holy Spirit it's delivered in such a way that it's life-giving, conviction will be life-giving when it's the Holy Spirit. And so, and so like, like you were saying a minute ago, it's, it's, that, it's that balance in grace and truth. And, and it, wasn't, it didn't say that, that Jesus was 50% and 50%. And depending if it was Tuesday, he might be 60, 40. It said that Jesus was full of grace and full of truth. That means God, who he's personifying here as a man, is 100% truth, 100% grace. He's 100% life and 100% light. That's the voice of God. It's pure truth. It's the purest form of truth, but it's always also the purest form of love and it's the purest form of grace that's available to us. That's what God's voice sounds like in our life. Yeah, and I wanna read this quote because I thought it was really cool and it kind of applies to this doing what feels good because that's something that I tell the guys all the time. Like you have to be really careful about that. There's a lot of things in life that feel good, but they end in a lot of bitterness and, and not. Anyway, it says, uh, if you do something shameful in pursuit of pleasure, uh, the, the pleasure passes quickly, but the shame endures. Um, but if you accomplish something good with hard work, the labor passes quickly, but the good endures. And that really is uh, a generic statement, but it really applies to faith and your walk with God. Sometimes that's a lot of the time what life looks like. So it's kind of a warning to uh, quick pleasures. And I know that's something that you guys know about already, but um, really balancing out the good life feeling that you feel not to justify cheating but to really use uh, Jesus' life as an example to the best of your ability and then God's word, you know, balancing it with God's word. 
Yeah, that's really good. So when you're looking for God's general, dile- general direction in your life, it's going to be balanced. It's going to be balanced on the word of God, the life of God, and the spirit of life inside of you. That's what the Holy Spirit sounds like in your life. That's what his voice sounds like. And so, I, so we talked a few minutes about just kind of generally speaking, but I know there's some of you sitting out here today that are going, I have a specific question that I've been trying to hear from God on, right? Like, do I take the job promotion? Do we move my family? Are we buying the house? And um, back to kind of what I said earlier, I think learning to hear God's voice on specific direction involves the practice of hearing his voice all the time and knowing who he is in general direction. And so when you're looking to hear God's voice in a specific way, all of those rules still apply. When God tells you something specifically, it's not going to be misaligned with God's word, with the life of Jesus and the life of love, right? It's not gonna be misaligned with any of those things. On a specific direction, it will always align with that. God's not gonna tell you to move your family away and just stop going to church and stop tithing. That's not what God's word says. And so if the job promotion's taking you there, that might not be it, right? It's not going to be counter- balance to what God's word is saying and what God's life is saying, right? So we know that. We know when God gives us specific direction, it will look that way. But I think one thing that's important, and this goes back to the the man having the affair and telling all his friends, it's important to have confirmation of godly counsel in your life. And I think sometimes what we wanna do is when we're listening for God's voice on a specific direction, at least it happens to me, maybe it happens to some of you as well, but people come to you and they go, okay, as my pastor, do I take the job or not? And my question is, well, what did God tell you, right? And so I think when searching God for specific direction, it's important that you first go seek God for yourself. And when you feel like God has spoken to you about that specific direction, it's always a good idea to go and get some godly counsel and wisdom in your life. Somebody that has that outside perspective, the the friend that's able to say, no, having an affair is not God's will, right? Just to kind of check you, make sure that you're not singing the wrong song lyrics to the tune that you've written yourself in that area well and as friends we should always be pushing people to be the best version of them what is that the best version of you is you with God I really believe that all the way and I think it's scriptural like the best version of uh, I always like to pick on Josh he's on the front row but the best version of Josh is Josh when he's paired up with God Mm-hmm. He's almost a different person, yeah? You can hand yeah, clap that. Yeah, we can that. clap that out. Amen? Because <laughs> yeah. we've all seen Josh when he's not with God. You know what I'm saying? We love you, Josh. <laughs> no, I can pick on him. He's like a brother. But, but yes, that. Sh- so if you're wondering, what, should, what advice should I give people? Give them that advice. The advice you should be doing, if you really love somebody and you really care about them, then you should be pushing them at any chance that you get, anytime they open a door for you to speak into their life. Push them towards being the best version of them, which is them with God, right? You gave some good advice to the men a few weeks ago about godly counsel in your life. Yeah, well, I started with this, another proverb, but it says, uh, where there's no counsel, the people will fall. But in the multitude of counselors, there's safety. And I talked kind of about, um, I was watching this guy who's like an athletic coach and he was talking to sports athletes and he was giving them all these tips on like, these five fundamental things that guys need but they don't always have in their life and it's like they're strategically placed there and this guy works with like high-end athletes so he's like it he's a he's a faith believing person but he teaches this to the secular world and says that like even though it's biblical it's still something I can repackage and present to them but he was saying the five things that you need is you need a savior first and foremost you need God in your life so that you can start down the right path obviously for salvation, but just for your life, period. Um, Secondly, you need a team, which he equates to like church. You know, like when you come to a church, it's basically like your team that you're on. Um, It's it's, uh, you getting behind a vision that's bigger than you is an important part of your life. Um, to know that you're contributing to something that's bigger. You know what I'm saying? Like, even though not all you guys acted in VBS, like you all played an active role in some way. You know what I'm saying? Either through volunteering or some of you just financially help support it. Like, you're all part of that team and that bigger vision. Does that make sense? So even though you're at work that week, knowing that um, something that you sewed into is going on and there's all these kids here getting ministered to is is something that you're a part of. So that's the team that you're on. You're on this team here, but um, third would be teammates. And that's like, I, I put bros here because these are the people that like- Gals. Uh, yeah, gals, sure. 
Galgang. That the ones that are there for you when you're down and you're not on the team, if that makes any sense, because sometimes you lose steam and you kind of fall off. They're the ones that call you up like, hey, man, where are you? Are you OK? Is everything all right? Do you need anything? Are you out of work? Do you need me to hook you up with something? Like those are your friends that are important that you have. And, and uh, that's what we're trying to do with groups here. I don't know if you guys know we had groups last night. And uh, the groups uh, are, are pretty awesome. I really like it. But it's, it's something that we can get to know each other better because there's only so much getting to know each other you can do on, on this scale. You know what I mean? But when you get into smaller groups with people, you build better relationships. And that's where some of your really good friends can come from because these are the kind of people that will push you to be the best version of you. And to be honest, that's really what a friend does. You know what I'm saying? Uh, sometimes we get it mixed up. We think the friends are the ones that... Uh, you know, we party with sometimes that, we, you know, as long as we're doing their thing, they're real cool. But if we start to be something different, they don't like that. They don't like when we try to be the best version of us. They want to pull us right back where we used to be. You know what I'm saying? Like, truthfully, those aren't real friends. Those are selfish people. You have to know the difference. You know what I'm saying? Somebody that isn't selfish can speak to you for what's best for you. And that's a real friend. Yeah. Anyway, I'm not trying to dog anybody's friends. I'm just saying know the difference between an actual bro or a gal and just an associate or an acquaintance that's convenient to party with in this season of your life. Does that make sense? Because there's a lot of those. They're everywhere. Yep. And they're going to be real cool with you as long as you're doing what they're doing. But the second you take a detour, they're gone like that. Yeah, some of y'all know real, real well about that. Number four thing was to have a coach in your life. So I equate this to like a professional. So it's important, especially for guys and for women too. If they're going to set out on a, some kind of career path, it's important that you have someone professional in your life that you can glean information from and learn and save yourself a lot of headache and a lot of financial ruin, right? Like you can learn from someone else's mistakes. And then number five was uh, kind of what we were talking about here. And that's having a counselor and um, the e equivalent to that in the Bible is like a mentor, somebody that's a spiritual mentor that can really speak to um, where you're at in your life and speak to not just your uh, normal day-to-day -day life, but actually your spiritual condition. And they're different, they're different things. And this would be somebody in your life that you're very open with and you're okay with them checking you. You know, and I know a lot of guys, it's tough to be checked. Guys don't like it. Well, most guys don't. Some guys don't mind. Um, I don't like it but I know it's best for me. And so I have to choose to set that up in my life because it doesn't just magically happen. Does that make sense? If somebody comes up and calls me out about something, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shove them out. So it has to be something that I go, you know what? I need this in my life. I'm going to go intentionally set this up. And I'm going to give somebody the right to call me out if I'm acting a fool or if I'm out of whack. Because yeah, like I said, if as uh, guys, sometimes we struggle with, pride issues and ego. I'm not any better than anyone in the room. I have to go and set that up on purpose. You know what I'm saying? And so anyway, it's these five things that are like critical for you being like a, a decent functioning member of society and successful. They actually, the guy wrote this piece in there. He says the high caliber athletes, like when they're playing at a high caliber, he says it's actually like 10% skill and 90% mental. And like, that's why you see athletes go through like shooting slumps or whatever. It's, it's all mental. And he was saying like, if you're uh, like not right on the inside, like you can't perform. It doesn't matter how talented you are. He's like, so trying to keep these guys on the right page and keeping them in, 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 on the right path is uh, like one of the most important things for their whole career, you know? And it's, I don't think it's any different for us just living normal life. I don't, I think it's the same thing. I think we all need those, that counsel in our life. Right. And, and the Bible says that. Yeah. And so it's, it's that counsel that when we feel like we're hearing God's voice, that's why we have Christian counsel in our life. That's why we come to church. That's why we get in groups. That's why we have people in our life that can help mentor us on our spiritual journey. Just people that go, hey, you, that, that doesn't sound like God's voice. You need to keep praying about that. Hey, the way you're responding to that, that doesn't sound like how Jesus would respond, right? We let people in our life have counsel in our life that will do that because that will strengthen us, strengthen us to really know that voice of truth and make sure that we are hearing God 
God's voice on a specific direction. And so just really being keyed into what the voice of truth is, is important. And I was thinking about sometimes, this goes back to having people challenge you. I think for some of us, um, the voice of God tends to always sound like what we want it to sound like. And that's what, you'd probably say this in a really cool tweetable way, but what I'm pretty much saying here is if you just keep hearing what you want to hear and it's always what you want to hear, that's not God's voice. Because God's voice will challenge you sometimes. Sometimes God's voice will say, you weren't in the right there, right? And I know there's been so many times personally, babe, that we've maybe had a skirmish, a spiritual conflict. And I oh, have man. gone in my prayer closet to pray you down. And usually when I end up leaving, God's prayed me down. Not that you probably weren't wrong, but <laughs> that I played my part as well. And sometimes God's more, um, more invested in changing us sometimes than changing our circumstance. And sometimes we just keep tweaking God's voice to sound like a voice that allows us to be a victim to our circumstance, right? But really knowing God's voice, sometimes God's voice won't sound like what you want it to. That still small voice though will convict us, it'll shape us, it'll change us, it will challenge us and it will grow us. And that's what God's voice sounds like in our life. And so that was my question I wrote here in my notes, like do you ever get checked? If you're not getting checked by the Holy Spirit, you need to tune in a little bit sharper because his voice will check you sometimes. His voice will challenge you sometimes. His voice will cause you to rethink. But that really comes from us really having a repentful posture, really a posture and a humility to go, God, I wanna hear your voice. God, it's not my voice I wanna hear. It's not the voice of offense I wanna hear. It's not the voice of I'm always right I wanna hear. But God, I, I really want to hear your voice in all things. It, it's your voice that I want to hear. And I think sometimes the best way to hear God's voice in our lives is just to come humbly and with a pure heart, you know? Yeah, and I think it's also like a saying that you wanna be the best version of you. I do, that's what I want for my life. I want to be the best version of James that I can be while I'm drawing air on this earth. And I wanna press into being the best version that, that God has laid out for my life. And so what does that look like? That looks like me being constantly challenged. Y'all think it's easy for me to be here. Y'all don't know me that well. Like to know where I came from, to be sitting in this seat right now speaking to you guys, I've had to be habitually uncomfortable because you can't grow and be comfortable. They Not don't the go together. <laughs> So if you're gonna let God work in your life, you gotta start by saying you want that. And then secondly, like that needs to be your prayer. God, if I'm um, outside of that, like start molding and crafting me, God, and put people in my life that help me go stay on that path. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, and surround me with people that keep pushing me towards being the best version of me, that are constantly trying to support me as I step. You know what I'm saying? Because stepping alone is hard. You need people there around you to support you. Yep. You know what I'm saying? Yep. And having the boldness to really say the prayer, not just the prayer to change everything else, but the bold prayer to say, God, change me. God, search my heart. Right? And then that's what Jesus said. He said, blessed are the pure of heart, for they will see God. It's, it's those that come at God with a pure heart. Those that are coming in humbling, going, God, I want to hear your voice. God, speak to me today. Speak to me in this moment. Speak to me. When I start feeling offended or angry or upset or worried or anxious, none of that are things from God. And those are those moments that we pause and reflect and go, hey, God, search me. I'm off track here. I mean, God, I don't want you to, to change reality to fit into my emotions. God, my emotions got to develop to change into what the reality is, but not the world's reality, into your reality, God. So give me your sight, give me your vision, give me your ear, give me your heart. Create in me a clean heart, oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. And a couple of weeks ago when we, we shared about, about Samuel hearing God for the first time, I, I love what, what Samuel finally said when he finally recognized it was God's voice. He said this, he said, speak Lord for your servant is listening. He didn't say I'm listening, it's about me. He said your servant. It's not about me, God, it's about you and your servant is listening. And that's the, that's the humility that he walked into. And if we can't humble ourselves before God, it's really hard to hear his voice. 
And I think that's what's made the noise around us in our world today kind of hard to hear God, because everything's just so loud. Everything's so offended. There's so much strife and so much dissension, but really slowing down enough to go, God, I'm probably not always right, God, and I, I wanna hear your voice. God, I wanna do your will. God, I wanna do your agenda, your purposes, your plans. That's the voice I wanna hear. That's the voice of truth. No wonder the voice of truth has gotten so confusing. It's not been God's voice. So it's really a challenge, like you said, to really be able to go, I wanna be the best version of me, and me being the best version of me begins with the best version of him being made known to me for his voice of truth to live through me. Wow, what a powerful message. I pray that it blesses you as much as it blessed me. We always wanna give you an opportunity to be a part of what God is doing here at LS Church. There's always something going on from kids to youth, all kinds of crazy stuff. So if you do wanna give, text LS Church to 77977, or you can head to our website, lschurch.tv. Well, hey, thanks again for watching, and we'll see you next week.